Chapter Four of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nolophidian. Best Russian Short Stories, edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Cloak by Nikolai Gogol, Part Two. Where the host lived, unfortunately, we cannot say. Our memory begins to fail us badly. The houses and streets in St. Petersburg have become so mixed up in our head that it is very difficult to get anything out of it again in proper form. This much is certain, that the official lived in the best part of the city, and therefore it must have been anything but near to Akaki Akakievich's residence. Akaki Akakievich was first obliged to traverse a kind of wilderness of deserted, dimly lighted streets. But in proportion, as he approached the official's quarter of the city, the streets became more lively, more populous, and more brilliantly illuminated. Pedestrians began to appear. Handsomely dressed ladies were more frequently encountered. The men had otter skin collars to their coats. Shabby sleigh men, with their wooden, railed sledges stuck over with brass-headed nails, became rarer, whilst, on the other hand, more and more drivers in red velvet caps, lacquered sledges and bearskin coats began to appear, and carriages with rich hammer cloths flew swiftly through the streets, their wheels scrunching the snow. Akaki Akakievich gazed upon all this as upon a novel sight. He had not been in the streets during the evening for years. He halted out of curiosity before a shop window, to look at a picture representing a handsome woman who had thrown off her shoe, thereby bearing her whole foot in a very pretty way, whilst behind the head of a man with whiskers and a handsome moustache peeped through the doorway of another room. Akaki Akakievich shook his head and laughed, and then went on his way. Why did he laugh? Either because he had met with a thing utterly unknown, but for which everyone cherishes, nevertheless, some sort of feeling, or else he thought, like many officials, Well, those French, what is to be said? If they go in for anything of that sort, why? But possibly he did not think at all. Akaki Akakievich at length reached the house, in which the head clerk's assistant lodged. He lived in fine style. The staircase was lit by a lamp, his apartment being on the second floor. On entering the vestibule, Akaki Akakievich beheld a whole row of galoshes on the floor. Among them, in the center of the room, stood a samovar, humming and emitting clouds of steam. On the walls hung all sorts of coats and cloaks, among which there were even some with beaver collars or velvet facings. Beyond, the buzz of conversation was audible and became clear and loud when the servant came out with a tray full of empty glasses, cream jugs, and sugar bowls. It was evident that the officials had arrived long before and had already finished their first glass of tea. Akaki Akakievich, having hung up his own cloak, entered the inner room. Before him all at once appeared lights, officials, pipes, and card tables, and he was bewildered by a sound of rapid conversation rising from all the tables, and the noise of moving chairs. He halted very awkwardly in the middle of the room, wondering what he ought to do, but they had seen him. They received him with a shout, and all thronged at once into the anteroom, and there took another look at his cloak. Akaki Akakievich, although somewhat confused, was frank-hearted, and could not refrain from rejoicing when he saw how they praised his cloak. Then, of course, they all dropped him and his cloak, and returned, as was proper, to the tables set out for whist. All this, the noise, the talk, and the throng of people, was rather overwhelming to Akaki Akakievich. He simply did not know where he stood, or where to put his hands, his feet, and his whole body. 
Finally he sat down by the players, looked at the cards, gazed at the face of one and another, and after a while began to gape, and to feel that it was wearisome, the more so as the hour was already long past when he usually went to bed. He wanted to take leave of the host, but they would not let him go, saying that he must not fail to drink a glass of champagne in honor of his new garment. In the course of an hour, supper, consisting of vegetable salad, cold veal, pastry, confectioner's pies, and champagne, was served. They made Akaki Akakievich drink two glasses of champagne, after which he felt things grow livelier. Still, he could not forget that it was twelve o'clock, and that he should have been at home long ago. In order that the host might not think of some excuse for detaining him, he stole out of the room quickly, sought out in the anteroom his cloak, which, to his sorrow, he found lying on the floor, brushed it, picked off every speck upon it, put it on his shoulders, and descended the stairs into the street. In the street all was still bright. Some petty shops, those permanent clubs of servants and all sorts of folks, were open. Others were shut, but nevertheless showed a streak of light the whole length of the door crack, indicating that they were not yet free of company, and that probably some domestics, male and female, were finishing their stories and conversations, whilst leaving their masters in complete ignorance as to their whereabouts. Akaki Akakievich went on in a happy frame of mind. He even started to run, without knowing why, after some lady who flew past like a flash of lightning. But he stopped short, and went on very quietly as before, wondering why he had quickened his pace. Soon there spread before him these deserted streets which are not cheerful in the daytime, to say nothing of the evening. Now they were even more dim and lonely. The lanterns began to grow rarer. Oil, evidently, had been less liberally supplied. Then came wooden houses and fences. Not a soul anywhere. Only the snow sparkled in the streets, and mournfully veiled the low-roofed cabins with their closed shutters. He approached the spot where the street crossed a vast square, with houses barely visible on its farther side, a square which seemed a fearful desert. Afar, a tiny spark glimmered from some watchman's box, which seemed to stand on the edge of the world. Akaki Akakievich's cheerfulness diminished at this point in a marked degree. He entered the square, not without an involuntary sensation of fear, as though his heart warned him of some evil. He glanced back, and on both sides it was like a sea about him. No, it is better not to look, he thought, and went on closing his eyes. When he opened them to see whether he was near the end of the square, he suddenly beheld, standing just before his very nose, some bearded individuals of precisely what sort he could not make out. All grew dark before his eyes, and his heart throbbed. Of course the cloak is mine, said one of them in a loud voice, seizing hold of his collar. Akaki Akakievich was about to shout, Help! when the second man thrust a fist, about the size of an official's head, at his very mouth, muttering, Just you dare to scream! Akaki Akakievich felt them strip off his cloak and give him a kick. He fell headlong upon the snow and felt no more. In a few minutes he recovered consciousness and rose to his feet, but no one was there. He felt that it was cold in the square, and that his cloak was gone. He began to shout, but his voice did not appear to reach the outskirts of the square. In despair, but without ceasing to shout, he started at a run across the square, straight towards the watch-box, beside which stood the watchman, leaning on his halberd, and apparently curious to know what kind of a customer was running towards him shouting. Akaki Akakievich ran up to him, and began in a sobbing voice to shout that he was asleep and attended to nothing, and did not see when a man was robbed. 
The watchman replied that he had seen two men stop him in the middle of the square, but supposed that they were friends of his, and that, instead of scolding vainly, he had better go to the police on the morrow, so that they might make a search for whoever had stolen the cloak. Akaki Akakievich ran home, and arrived in a state of complete disorder. His hair, which grew very thinly upon his temples, and the back of his head all tussled, his body, arms, and legs covered with snow. The old woman, who was mistress of his lodgings, on hearing a terrible knocking, sprang hastily from her bed, and, with only one shoe on, ran to open the door, pressing the sleeve of her chemise to her bosom out of modesty. But when she had opened it, she fell back on beholding Akaki Akakievich in such a condition. When he told her about the affair, she clasped her hands, and said that he must go straight to the district chief of police, for his subordinate would turn up his nose, promise well, and drop the matter there. The very best thing to do, therefore, would be to go to the district chief, whom she knew, because Finnish Anna, her former cook, was now nurse at his house. She often saw him passing the house, and he was at church every Sunday, praying, but at the same time gazing cheerfully at everybody, so that he must be a good man, judging from all appearances. Having listened to this opinion, Akaki Akakievich betook himself sadly to his room, and how he spent the night there, any one who can put himself in another's place may readily imagine. Early in the morning, he presented himself at the district chief's, but was told the official was asleep. He went again at ten, and was again informed that he was asleep. At eleven, and they said, the superintendent is not at home. At dinner time, and the clerks in the anteroom would not admit him on any terms, and insisted upon knowing his business. So that at last, for once in his life, Akaki Akakievich felt an inclination to show some spirit, and said curtly that he must see the chief in person, that they ought not to presume to refuse him entrance, and that he came from the Department of Justice, and that when he complained of them, they would see. The clerks made no reply to this, and one of them went to call the chief, who listened to the strange story of the theft of the coat. Instead of directing his attention to the principal points in the matter, he began to question Akaki Akakievich. Why was he going home so late? Was he in the habit of doing so, or had he been to some disorderly house? So that Akaki Akakievich got thoroughly confused, and left him, without knowing whether the affair of his cloak was in proper train or not. All that day, for the first time in his life, he never went near the department. The next day he made his appearance very pale and in his old cape, which had become even more shabby. The news of the robbery of the cloak touched many, although there were some officials present who never lost an opportunity, even such a one as the present, of ridiculing Akaki Akakievich. They decided to make a collection for him on the spot, but the officials had already spent a great deal in subscribing for the director's portrait, and for some book, at the suggestion of the head of that division, who was a friend of the author, and so the sum was trifling. One of them, moved by pity, resolved to help Akaki Akakievich with some good advice, at least, and told him that he ought not to go to the police, for although it might happen that a police officer, wishing to win the approval of his superiors, might hunt up the cloak by some means, still his cloak would remain in the possession of the police, if he did not offer legal proof that it belonged to him. The best thing for him, therefore, would be to apply to a certain prominent personage, since this prominent personage, by entering into relation with the proper persons, could greatly expedite the matter. As there was nothing else to be done, Akaki Akakievich decided to go to the prominent personage. What was the exact official position of the prominent personage remains unknown to this day. The reader must know that the prominent personage had but recently become a prominent personage, having, up to that time, been only an insignificant person. Moreover, his present position 
was not considered prominent in comparison with others still more so. But there is always a circle of people to whom what is insignificant in the eyes of others is important enough. Moreover, he strove to increase his importance by sundry devices. For instance, he managed to have the inferior officials meet him on the staircase when he entered upon his service. No one was to presume to come directly to him, but the strictest etiquette must be observed. The collegiate recorder must make a report to the government secretary, the government secretary to the titular councillor, or whatever other man was proper, and all business must come before him in this manner. In holy Russia, all this is contaminated with the love of imitation. Every man imitates and copies his superior. They even say that a certain titular councillor, when promoted to the head of some small separate office, immediately partitioned off a private room for himself, called it the audience chamber, and posted at the door a lackey with a red collar and braid, who grasped the handle of the door and opened to all comers, though the audience chamber would hardly hold an ordinary writing table. The manners and customs of the prominent personage were grand and imposing, but rather exaggerated. The main foundation of his system was strictness. Strictness, strictness, and always strictness, he generally said, and at the last word he looked significantly into the face of the person to whom he spoke. But there was no necessity for this, for the half-score of subordinates, who formed the entire force of the office, were properly afraid. On catching sight of him afar off, they left their work, and waited, drawn up in line, until he had passed through the room. His ordinary converse with his inferiors smacked of sternness, and consisted chiefly of three phrases. How dare you! Do you know whom you are speaking to? Do you realize who is standing before you? Otherwise he was a very kind-hearted man, good to his comrades and ready to oblige. But the rank of general threw him completely off his balance. On receiving any one of that rank, he became confused, lost his way, as it were, and never knew what to do. If he chanced to be amongst his equals, he was still a very nice kind of man, a very good fellow in many respects, and not stupid. But the very moment that he found himself in the society of people, but one rank lower than himself, he became silent, and his situation aroused sympathy, the more so as he felt himself that he might have been making an incomparably better use of his time. In his eyes there was sometimes visible a desire to join some interesting conversation or group, but he was kept back by the thought, would it not be a very great condescension on his part? Would it not be familiar? And would he not thereby lose his importance? And in consequence of such reflections, he always remained in the same dumb state, uttering from time to time a few monosyllabic words, and thereby earning the name of the most wearisome of men. To this prominent personage, Akaki Akakievich presented himself, and this at the most unfavorable time for himself, though opportune for the prominent personage. The prominent personage was in his cabinet, conversing very gaily with an old acquaintance and companion of his childhood, whom he had not seen for several years, and who had just arrived, when it was announced to him that a person named Bashmachkin had come. He asked abruptly, who is he? Some official, he was informed. Ah, he can wait. This is no time for him to call, said the important man. It must be remarked here that the important man lied outrageously. He had said all he had to say to his friend long before, and the conversation had been interspersed for some time with very long pauses, during which they merely slapped each other on the leg and said, You think so, Ivan Abramovich? Just so, Stepan Varlamovich. Nevertheless, he ordered that the official should be kept waiting, in order to show his friend, a man who had not been in the service for a long time, but had lived at home in the country, 
how long officials had to wait in his anteroom. At length, having talked himself completely out, and more than that, having had his fill of pauses, and smoked a cigar in a very comfortable armchair with reclining back, he suddenly seemed to recollect and said to the secretary, who stood by the door with papers of reports, So it seems that there is an official waiting to see me. Tell him that he may come in. On perceiving Akaki Akakievich's modest mien and his worn uniform, he turned abruptly to him and said, What do you want? in a curt, hard voice, which he had practiced in his room in private and before the looking-glass for a whole week before being raised to his present rank. Akaki Akakievich, who was already imbued with a due amount of fear, became somewhat confused, and as well as his tongue would permit, explained, with a rather more frequent addition than usual of the word that, that his cloak was quite new, and had been stolen in the most inhuman manner, that he had applied to him, in order that he might in some way, by his intermediation, that he might enter into correspondence with the chief of police, and find the cloak. For some inexplicable reason, this conduct seemed familiar to the prominent personage. "'What, my dear sir,' he said abruptly, "'are you not acquainted with etiquette? "'To whom have you come? "'Don't you know how such matters are managed? "'You should first have presented a petition to the office. "'It would have gone to the head of the department, "'then to the chief of division, "'then it would have been handed over to the secretary, "'and the secretary would have given it to me.' "'But your excellency,' said Akaki Akakievich, "'trying to collect his small handful of wits, "'and conscious at the same time that he was perspiring terribly, "'I, your excellency, presume to trouble you "'because secretaries are an untrustworthy race.' "'What, what, what?' said the important personage. "'Where did you get such courage?' Where did you get such ideas? What impudence towards their chiefs and superiors has spread among the young generation? The prominent personage apparently had not observed that Akaki Akakievich was already in the neighborhood of fifty. If he could be called a young man, it must have been in comparison with some one who was seventy. Do you not know to whom you were speaking? Do you realize who is standing before you? Do you realize it? Do you realize it? I ask you. Then he stamped his foot, and raised his voice to such a pitch that it would have frightened even a different man from Akaki Akakievich. Akaki Akakievich's senses failed him. He staggered, trembled in every limb, and, if the porters had not run in to support him, would have fallen to the floor. They carried him out insensible. But the prominent personage, gratified that the effect should have surpassed his expectations, and quite intoxicated with the thought that his word could even deprive a man of his senses, glanced sideways at his friend in order to see how he looked upon this, and perceived, not without satisfaction, that his friend was in a most uneasy frame of mind, and even beginning on his part to feel a trifle frightened. Akaki Akakievich could not remember how he descended the stairs, and got into the street. He felt neither his hands nor feet. Never in his life had he been so raided by any high official, let alone a strange one. He went staggering on through the snowstorm, which was blowing in the streets, with his mouth wide open. The wind, in St. Petersburg fashion, darted upon him from all quarters and down every cross street, in a twinkling it had blown a quinsy into his throat, and he reached home unable to utter a word. His throat was swollen, and he lay down on his bed. So powerful is sometimes a good scolding. The next day a violent fever developed. Thanks to the generous assistance of the St. Petersburg climate, the malady progressed more rapidly than could have been expected, and when the doctor arrived, he found, on feeling the sick man's pulse, that there was nothing to be done except to prescribe a poultice. 
so that the patient might not be left entirely without the beneficent aid of medicine. But at the same time he predicted his end in thirty-six hours. After this he turned to the landlady and said, And as for you, don't waste your time on him. Order his pine coffin now, for an oak one will be too expensive for him. Did Akaki Akakievich hear these fatal words? And if he heard them, did they produce any overwhelming effect upon him? Did he lament the bitterness of his life? We know not, for he continued in a delirious condition. Visions incessantly appeared to him, each stranger than the other. Now he saw Petrovich, and ordered him to make a cloak with some traps for robbers, who seemed to him to be always under the bed, and he cried every moment to the landlady to pull one of them from under his coverlet. Then he inquired why his old mantle hung before him when he had a new cloak. Next he fancied that he was standing before the prominent person, listening to a thorough setting down and saying, Forgive me, your excellency. But at last he began to curse, uttering the most horrible words, so that his aged landlady crossed herself, never in her life having heard anything of the kind from him, and more so as these words followed directly after the words, Your Excellency. Later on he talked utter nonsense, of which nothing could be made, all that was evident being that these incoherent words and thoughts hovered ever about one thing, his cloak. At length, poor Akaki Akakievich breathed his last. They sealed up neither his room nor his effects, because, in the first place, there were no heirs, and in the second, there was very little to inherit beyond a bundle of goose quills, a choir of white official paper, three pairs of socks, two or three buttons which had burst off his trousers, and the mantle already known to the reader. To whom all this fell, God knows. I confess that the person who told me this tale took no interest in the matter. They carried Akaki Akakievich out and buried him, and St. Petersburg was left without Akaki Akakievich, as though he had never lived there. A being disappeared, who was protected by none, dear to none, interesting to none, and who never even attracted to himself the attention of those students of human nature who omit no opportunity of thrusting a pin through a common fly and examining it under the microscope. A being who bore meekly the jibes of the department and went to his grave without having done one unusual deed, but to whom, nevertheless, at the close of his life, appeared a bright visitant in the form of a cloak, which momentarily cheered his poor life, and upon him, thereafter, an intolerable misfortune descended, just as it descends upon the heads of the mighty of this world. Several days after his death, the porter was sent from the department to his lodgings, with an order for him to present himself there immediately, the chief commanding it, but the porter had to return unsuccessful, with the answer that he could not come, and to the question why, replied, Well, because he is dead. He was buried four days ago. In this manner did they hear of Akaki Akakievich's death at the department, and the next day a new official sat in his place, with a handwriting by no means so upright, but more inclined and slanting. But who could have imagined that this was not really the end of Akaki Akakievich, that he was destined to raise a commotion after death, as if in compensation for his utterly insignificant life? But so it happened, and our poor story unexpectedly gains a fantastic ending. A rumor suddenly spread through St. Petersburg that a dead man had taken to appearing on the Kalinkin Bridge, and its vicinity at night in the form of an official seeking a stolen cloak, and that, under the pretext of its being the stolen cloak, he dragged, without regard to rank or calling, everyone's cloak from his shoulders, be it catskin, beaver, fox, bear, sable, 
in a word every sort of fur and skin which men adopted for their covering one of the department officials saw the dead man with his own eyes and immediately recognized in him akaki akakievich this however inspired him with such terror that he ran off with all his might and therefore did not scan the dead man closely but only saw how the latter threatened him from afar with his finger constant complaints poured in from all quarters that the backs and shoulders not only of titular but even of court councillors were exposed to the danger of a cold on account of the frequent dragging off of their cloaks arrangements were made by the police to catch the corpse alive or dead at any cost and punish him as an example to others in the most severe manner in this they nearly succeeded for a watchman on guard in kurinskin lane caught the corpse by the collar on the very scene of his evil deeds when attempting to pull off the frieze cloak of a retired musician having seized him by the collar he summoned with a shout two of his comrades whom he enjoined to hold him fast while he himself felt for a moment in his boot in order to draw out his snuff-box and refresh his frozen nose but the snuff was of a sort which even a corpse could not endure the watchman having closed his right nostril with his finger had no sooner succeeded in holding half a handful up to the left than the corpse sneezed so violently that he completely filled the eyes of all three while they raised their hands to wipe them the dead man vanished completely so that they positively did not know whether they had actually had him in their grip at all thereafter the watchmen conceived such a terror of dead men that they were afraid even to seize the living and only screamed from a distance hey there go your way so the dead official began to appear even beyond the kalinkin bridge causing no little terror to all timid people but we have totally neglected that certain prominent personage who may really be considered as the cause of the fantastic turn taken by this true history first of all justice compels us to say that after the departure of poor annihilated akaki akakievich he felt something like remorse suffering was unpleasant to him for his heart was accessible to many good impulses in spite of the fact that his rank often prevented his showing his true self as soon as his friend had left his cabinet he began to think about poor akaki akakievich and from that day forth poor akaki akakievich who could not bear up under an official reprimand recurred to his mind almost every day the thought troubled him to such an extent that a week later he even resolved to send an official to him to learn whether he really could assist him and when it was reported to him that Akaki Akakievich had died suddenly of fever, he was startled, hearkened to the reproaches of his conscience, and was out of sorts for the whole day. Wishing to divert his mind in some way, and drive away the disagreeable impression, he set out that evening for one of his friend's houses, where he found quite a large party assembled what was better nearly every one was of the same rank as himself so that he need not feel in the least constrained this had a marvellous effect upon his mental state he grew expansive made himself agreeable in conversation in short he passed a delightful evening after supper he drank a couple of glasses of champagne not a bad recipe for cheerfulness as every one knows the champagne inclined him to various adventures, and he determined not to return home, but to go and see a certain well-known lady of German extraction, Karolina Ivanovna, a lady, it appears, with whom he was on a very friendly footing. It must be mentioned that the prominent personage was no longer a young man, but a good husband and respected father of a family. Two sons one of whom was already in the service and a good-looking sixteen-year-old daughter with a slightly arched but pretty little nose came every morning to kiss his hand and say bonjour papa his wife a still fresh and good-looking woman 
gave him her hand to kiss, and then, reversing the procedure, kissed his. But the prominent personage, though perfectly satisfied in his domestic relations, considered it stylish to have a friend in another quarter of the city. This friend was scarcely prettier or younger than his wife, but there are such puzzles in the world, and it is not our place to judge them. So the important personage descended the stairs, stepped into his sledge, said to the coachman, to Carolina Ivanovna's, and, wrapping himself luxuriously in his warm cloak, found himself in that delightful frame of mind than which a Russian can conceive nothing better, namely, when you think of nothing yourself, yet when the thoughts creep into your mind of their own accord, each more agreeable than the other, giving you no trouble either to drive them away or seek them. Fully satisfied, he recalled all the gay features of the evening just past, and all the mots which had made the little circle laugh. Many of them he repeated in a low voice, and found them quite as funny as before, so it is not surprising that he should laugh heartily at them. Occasionally, however, he was interrupted by gusts of wind, which, coming suddenly, God knows whence or why, cut his face drove masses of snow into it, filled out his cloak collar like a sail, or suddenly blew it over his head with supernatural force, and thus caused him constant trouble to disentangle himself. Suddenly the important personage felt some one clutch him firmly by the collar. Turning round, he perceived a man of short stature in an old, worn uniform, and recognized, not without terror, Akaki Akakievich. The official's face was white as snow, and looked just like a corpse's. But the horror of the important personage transcended all bounds when he saw the dead man's mouth open, and heard it utter the following remarks, while it breathed upon him the terrible odor of the grave. Ah, here you are at last. I have you that. By the collar. I need your cloak. You took no trouble about mine, but reprimanded me. So now give up your own. The pallid, prominent personage almost died of fright. Brave as he was in the office and in the presence of inferiors generally, and although, at the sight of his manly form and appearance, everyone said, Ugh, how much character he has! At this crisis, he, like many possessed of a heroic exterior, experienced such terror that, not without cause, he began to fear an attack of illness. He flung his cloak hastily from his shoulders and shouted to his coachman in an unnatural voice, Home at full speed! The coachman, hearing the tone which is generally employed at critical moments and even accompanied by something much more tangible, drew his head down between his shoulders in case of an emergency, flourished his whip, and flew on like an arrow. In a little more than six minutes, the prominent personage was at the entrance of his own house. Pale, thoroughly scared, and cloakless, he went home instead of to Karolina Ivanovna's, reached his room somehow or other, and passed the night in the direst distress so that the next morning over their tea his daughter said, "'You are very pale today, Papa.' But Papa remained silent, and said not a word to any one of what had happened to him, where he had been, or where he had intended to go. This occurrence made a deep impression upon him. He even began to say, "'How dare you? Do you realize who is standing before you?' less frequently to the under-officials, and, if he did utter the words, it was only after first having learned the bearings of the matter. But the most noteworthy point was that from that day forward the apparition of the dead official ceased to be seen. Evidently the prominent personage's cloak just fitted his shoulders. At all events, no more instances of his dragging cloaks from people's shoulders were heard of but many active and solicitous persons 
could by no means reassure themselves, and asserted that the dead official still showed himself in distant parts of the city. In fact, one watchman in Coloman saw with his own eyes the apparition come from behind a house. But the watchman was not a strong man, so he was afraid to arrest him, and followed him in the dark, until, at length, the apparition looked round, paused, and inquired, "'What do you want?' at the same time showing such a fist as is never seen on living men. The watchman said, Nothing, and turned back instantly. But the apparition was much too tall, wore huge mustaches, and, directing its steps apparently towards the Abukov Bridge, disappeared in the darkness of the night. End of the Cloak by Nikolai Gogol Part 2